Hello and welcome to the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services 2017 Free Rulemaking Kickoff. This meeting is to provide overviews of the measures under consideration and the measure applications partnership processes. My name is Martin Alvarado of Battelle, and along with Nicole Brennan, I will be moderating today's webinar. Today's meeting is audio broadcast only. All particip participants are asked to use computer audio to hear the presentations in listen only mode. The meeting is being recorded and will be posted on the CMS pre-rulemaking website in an on-demand video format for later viewing. The host will send out all participants a link to the recording as soon as it is available. Because of the listen-only format at any time during this session, you can type questions using the webinar's text format question and answer feature. You can see this feature in the lower right of your screen. Type your questions. Please make sure to ask all of your questions only through the Q&A feature and not through the chat option. As time permits and after our presenters conclude, we will read questions aloud for the presenters to answer. Questions that are of general interest but are not answered during the call may be added to the pre-rulemaking frequently asked questions document available on CMS's pre-rulemaking website after today's webinar. Everyone asking questions and the presenters who answer them on today's call are asked to please identify themselves by name and affiliation. I am pleased to introduce Michelle Jeppe of CMS, who will host the remainder of today's webinar. Thank you, Martin. I'm extremely honored to be here sharing information with you about this important topic, pre-rulemaking. Again, my name is Michelle Jeppe, and I am the agency's lead for pre-rulemaking, which is a process that's been around since 2011. Many of you are already familiar with pre-rulemaking, but hopefully, we will touch on some topics that maybe will refresh your memory or possibly provide you with some new bits of information. We will definitely mention some important dates for this coming season that you'll want to make note of. All right, here's an overview of the topics that we're going to cover today. I'm joined by my colleagues. We have presenters from CMS as well as the National Quality Forum and from Battelle. And now, just I want to announce a change in presenters. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Theodore Long from CMS's Center for Clinical Standards and Quality. Dr. Long is the Senior Medical Officer in the Quality, Measurement, and Value-Based Incentives Group. So take it away, Dr. Long. All right, thank you, Michelle, and thank you, everybody, for taking the time to join us today. So I'm starting on slide number three here. But to provide some background as we start into these slides and to orient you a little bit to how we're organized in the Quality Measurement and Value-Based Incentives Group, or QUIMVIG, we have a variety of divisions I'll quickly outline here. The Division of Quality Measurement oversees the measures development for psychiatric and hospital programs. The Division of Value, Incentives, and Quality Reporting is more on the programmatic and operations side of the hospital programs and the ESRD QIP program working closely with the Division of Quality Measurement. The Division of Electronic and Clinician Quality leads the Merit-Based Incentive Payment System, or MIPS, piece of MACRA, or the Quality Payment Program. And they also have historically led the PQRS work and align closely with folks who work on the value modifier and on meaningful use as well. As for the meaningful use piece, that work is led by the Division of Health IT. The Division of Chronic and Post-Acute Care manages our post-acute care quality programs. The measures development in the National Quality Forum work, including pre-rulemaking, falls under the Division of Program and Measurement Support. Not reflected in the slide are the other parts of the agency that QuimVig collaborates with, including the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation, or CMMI, and the Center for Medicare, or CM. Next slide, please. The middle of this slide reflects the three aims of the National Quality Strategy, which are better care, healthier people and healthier communities, and smarter spending. The inaugural National Quality Strategy, or NQS, was published on March 18, 2011. Quite a few years later, the NQS continues to be the national strategy and serves as a catalyst and compass for the nationwide focus. The NQS Quality Strategy pursues an alliance with the three broad aims of the National Quality Strategy. We also reflect on this slide the six priorities from the National Quality Strategy that became the goals for CMS's quality strategy. Under each one of these goals, we have systematically gone through a similar process 
at a detailed level that CMS did to further develop when operationalizing the NQS goals. We identified desired outcomes, objectives, initiatives, and activities. Next slide, please. When developing the goals, we also came up with four foundational principles that apply to each and every goal and guide the agency's action toward each of these goals. These principles are, as shown in the diagram, eliminate racial and ethnic disparities, strengthen infrastructure and data systems, enable local innovations, and foster learning organizations. We felt that unless these four foundational principles are explicitly incorporated into the operational plan to achieve our goals, CMS will not succeed in driving change to improve the quality and cost of care for all. Next slide, please. Finally, I want to offer a Quinvig leadership welcome. We've had a successful year in 2016. We had great feedback from our MAP members, and this has driven the measures we are proposing in our programs. In looking toward 2017, we have really worked to streamline the measures in our programs, and in an effort to focus on burden, expect to have a streamlined muck list. Additionally, we expect to more granularly identify measures we anticipate considering for our programs versus measures that we use as examples for important stakeholder conversations in cutting edge areas, such as patient report outcome measures or population health measures. With that, I will turn the presentation back and thank you for your time. Thank you, Dr. Long. Okay, so most of you are probably already familiar with the statute and its requirements. If so, this is the refresher for you. Pre-rulemaking got underway with Section 3014 of the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act. The law provides the statutory authority for the work that's associated with pre-rulemaking and drives CMS's deadline to publish the measures under consideration list annually by December 1st. The second step involves the Measures Application Partnership, or MAP, a convening body of multi-stakeholder groups. The MAP is currently operated and overseen by the National Quality Forum, or NQF. The MAP convenes each December and January to deliberate and vote on each measure under consideration list measure. And now for the third step. NQF facilitates these meetings and furnishes a report of their findings each February and March and later, Ms. Erin O'Rourke will talk more about this process in her presentation. Next slide, please. All right, so for the caveat, by program, a measure only has to go on the list once to be considered for rulemaking. If a measure has been on the list before but is now being considered for a different program, it should be added back to the list. And finally, if a measure has a substantive change, it should also be added back to the list. Next slide, please. This slide is a list of the federal programs that adopt measures through pre-rulemaking. For each program, CMS designates a program and measure lead. Measure leads have the primary responsibility for the development and review of quality measures, while program leads have the overall responsibility for the administration and operation of quality programs. Please send me an email if you'd like to know the CMS leads by program. My email address can be found at the end of the slide deck. All right, next slide, please. Quinzig measure and program leads put a lot of thought and work into developing and selecting measures for inclusion on the annual measures under consideration list. For example, CMS measure and program leads consider these questions to guide them when choosing measures for inclusion on the list. These deliberations ensure alignment with CMS's quality measurement priorities and the pre-rulemaking process. In addition to investigation into these outcomes of questions, CMS measure and program leads strive for transparency by seeking input from expert panels, focus groups, and by soliciting for recommendations by other federal agencies prior to adding the measures to the list. As demonstrated by their rigorous efforts, CMS leads are committed to bringing high value measures to their programs. I do want to emphasize that pre-rulemaking should not be confused with rulemaking, which is a separate, unique process that is quite different from pre-rulemaking and is also based on the statutory requirements of the said program. The leads would be able to provide more specifics 
on programmatic detail. Both pre-rulemaking and rulemaking are the same in that CMS continues with transparency in mind. For example, when proposing a measure for a rule, CMS thoroughly vets the MAPS feedback and the notice of the proposed rulemaking, or NPRM, and by incorporating a separate stakeholder commenting process for the proposed rule. All right, next slide, please. This slide provides a timeline of the measure's development process. From initial concept through adoption and a program, measurement development may take up to three years. Not depicted here is the intersecting regulatory requirements, such as the Impact Act, that may overlap with the standard measure under consideration timeline and may be the reason CMS implements an ad hoc measure under consideration list on occasion. All right, next slide, please. After measure development and testing concludes, CMS's pre-rulemaking process gets underway with the submission and internal review of measures using JIRA. JIRA is an issue tracking system that's a web-based interface that users with the proper credentials use to submit measure specifications along with some other pertinent data to CMS beginning each January. For the second year now, CMS has opened JIRA in January to begin the collection process for candidate measure submissions sooner. Earlier measures under consideration seasons didn't start this process until early May. So now developers have an extra three months to make their JIRA measure submissions. So what happens between January 31st and May 1st that's not depicted here? CMS is planning and preparing for the official measure under consideration season kickoff. During this time, I host a series of educational and outreach webinar with today's meeting being the first in a series of four. Later this week on Thursday, as well as next Thursday, I'll host an open forum discussion to demonstrate JIRA, as well as to respond to stakeholder questions. Next Tuesday, April the 11th, I'll host CMS's Measurement Needs and Priority Session. If you'd like to register for any of these events, please send me an email. To point out, the first three boxes on the slide pertain to JIRA system dates. To note, CMS will close JIRA on Friday, June 30th, prohibiting anyone from submitting new candidate measures after this date. Closing JIRA in late June signals the start of the federal clearance process, which relates to the last three boxes on this slide. After JIRA closes on June 30th, the measure and program leads begin the task of reviewing, accepting, or rejecting each and every submitted measure by program. The measures that make the cut essentially are the accepted measures, and these become the annual draft measures under consideration list, also known as the clearance document. The clearance document will be created on July the 21st. Before the list officially goes into formal clearance, on August 21st, it is previewed by all involved federal agency representatives at the August 3rd stakeholder meeting with the purpose of gaining consensus before clearance. And for those of you not familiar with the federal clearance process as it relates to the measures under consideration list, the list is basically shepherded across CMS, HHS, and OMB components and agencies involving collaboration, cooperation, and communication at varying degrees and levels in a relatively short amount of time to enable publishing of the list by December 1st. All right, next slide, please. As you can see here, since 2012, candidate measure submissions have trended downward. Each year beginning in 2011, CMS has met its statutory deadline of publishing the measures under consideration list by December 1st. This past year, I'm happy to report that we published the list a little earlier than in prior years. We always strive to do that, to publish or to provide as much time for public commenting before the MAP committee meetings occur each December. All right, next slide, please. This slide depicts the simultaneously occurring pre-rulemaking activities, deadlines, events, and tasks by demonstrating the annual cycle overlap. The actual activities themed in the boxes are less important than the idea that many related events happen each year, which are the precursors to rulemaking and contribute to con continuous process improvements by implementing lean practices year after year across CMS, other federal agencies, and the contractors supporting pre-rulemaking. 
Communication, collaboration, and coordination occurs constantly to ensure transparency, lean practices, harmonization, and to ensure quality goals are successfully achieved. All right, next slide, please. CMS's goal is to glean feedback for the Measure Applications Partnership, or MAP, to focus on the potential fit of proposed measures in our programs. The best way to keep the focus where it should be is to have good documentation on the measures supporting the science, the business, and testing. We have been challenged by the industry and challenge ourselves to bring forward only measures that described improved outcomes, so low bar measures are unlikely to be accepted. All right, next slide, please. As I referenced on slide 12, these seats represent the education and outreach series that I host each pre-rulemaking season. Again, if you'd like to register for any of these meetings, please send me an email, which is again found at the end of this slide deck. You may also access additional CMS pre-rulemaking resources by clicking on the link at the bottom of the slide. And with that, it is my pleasure to turn the presentation over to our next presenter, Erin O'Rourke, with the National Quality Forum. Thanks, Michelle. Uh, good morning, everyone. As Michelle noted, um, my name is Erin O'Rourke, and I'm one of the senior directors here at NQF, uh, supporting the work of the Measure Applications Partnership. Next slide. So as Michelle noted, uh, the Measure Applications Partnership, or MAP, is tasked with reviewing the measures under consideration and providing input to CMS about their potential use. MAP is a group of committees and work groups that give guidance to CMS about which measures uh, could potentially be used in selected Medicare public reporting and performance-based payment programs. MAP is comprised of representatives from both the government and the private sectors. MAP is a unique collaboration that balances the interests of consumers, businesses and purchasers, labor, health plans, clinicians and providers, communities and states, and suppliers. MAP aims to advance the goals of the National Quality Strategy. One of the key ways it does so is through the approval making process. MAP works to inform the selection of measures to promote uh, improvement, transparency, and value for all. Uh, in addition to providing input on the measures under consideration uh, for the various federal programs, MAP also works to identify gaps in measure development, testing, and endorsement and encourages alignment across the public and private sectors, as well as across programs, settings, level of analysis, and populations to promote care coordination and to reduce data collection burden. Next slide. So what is the value of this pre making input? Uh, MAP aims to facilitate a multi-stakeholder dialogue that includes representatives from HHS and allow for a consensus building process among stakeholders in an open, transparent forum uh, so that members of the public are also able to participate. Ultimately, we hope that proposed laws are closer to the mark uh, since the main provisions around performance measurement have already been vetted by the affected stakeholders, and hopefully this will reduce the effort required by individual stakeholder groups to submit official comments on proposed rules. Next slide. MAP operates through a two-tier structure. Uh, measures under consideration are divided up by the program for which they're being considered. Uh, measures are then reviewed by one of three setting-specific work groups uh, that provide initial recommendations to the coordinating committee. Uh, we have the hospital work group, the clinician work group, and the post-acute care long-term care work group uh, that provide input during the pre-roll making process. Uh, there's also an overarching coordinating committee that is tasked with looking across all of the programs and the measures under consideration and finalizing MAPS recommendations to HHS. Next slide. A single nominations process updates the entire membership of MAP annually. About one-third of members have terms that are up for renewal each year. Uh, the MAP rosters are uh, approved by the National Quality Forum Board of Directors. Uh, based on the rosters, appointed members fall into one of three categories. Organizational representatives make up the majority of MAP's membership. Uh, they include those who are affected by or interested in the use of performance measurement and are chosen by the organization seated on MAP. Uh, the organizational representative should represent its entire constituency. Subject matter experts serve as an individual representative uh, that has content-specific knowledge that they can offer to the MAP deliberations. Uh, as a process note, the co-chairs that lead each group fall into this category. 
And then finally, we have the federal government liaisons who serve as non-voting ex officio members. Next slide. MAP uses a four-step approach to review a measure under consideration. First, NQF staff develop a framework that helps to show what measures are currently in use in a program. Uh, generally, we'll use a category like the National Quality Strategy Priorities and Clinical Condition. Uh, this aims to just give uh, MAP members and members of the public a snapshot of what uh, is currently being used. MAP Next evaluates each measure under consideration uh, for what it might add to the program measure set. And then finally, MAP takes two steps to provide input on how the program measure set could be improved in future years. Uh, MAP identifies any outstanding measurement gaps and suggests measures uh, that could potentially be removed in future years. Next slide. The measure selection criteria, or the MSC as we sometimes refer to them, are a tool that MAP uses to assess sets of measures used in a quality initiative program. They're intended to assist MAP uh, to identify what an ideal set of measures for a public reporting or a value-based payment program would look like. Uh, they evaluate a measure set as a whole, uh, which is a key thing to remember as we go through these, um, recognizing that no one measure could hit each of these criteria. Uh, the criteria are not absolute rules. Uh, rather, they're meant to provide general guidance on measure selection decisions and to complement any program-specific statutory, statutory and regulatory requirements. The central focus should be on the selection of high-quality measures that optimally address the national quality strategy's three aims, fill critical measurement gaps, and increase alignment. Although competing priorities often need to be weighed against one another, the measure selection criteria can be used as a reference when evaluating the relative strengths and weaknesses of a program measure set and how the, the addition of an individual measure would contribute to the set. Uh, the criteria have evolved over time to reflect the input of a wide variety of stakeholders. Uh, to determine whether a measure uh, would be supported for rulemaking for a specified program, MAP evaluates the measures under consideration against the measure selection criteria. Next slide. So MAP work groups must reach a decision about every measure under consideration. Uh, we've standardized the decision categories to ensure consistency across the group. And each decision is accompanied by one or more statements of rationale that explains why MAP came to that decision. Uh, I did just want to note uh, for those of you that have uh, been familiar with the process throughout the year, in 2016-2017, uh, we updated the decision categories and we are no longer evaluating uh, measures under development using different decision categories. So every measure on the list uh, receives one of four standardized decision categories. Uh, next slide. So after applying the measure selection criteria to the program measure set as a whole, MAP reviews uh, the measures under consideration for the current pre-rulemaking cycle. MAP, as I uh, stated, MAP re reaches a decision about every measure under consideration. I did want to just show you uh, what these decision categories were for 2016-2017. Uh, we do have four categories. They are support for rulemaking, conditional support for rulemaking, refine and resubmit prior to rulemaking, uh, do not submit support for rulemaking. MAP may support a measure for rulemaking for a number of reasons. It may address a previously identified gap in a program or help to promote alignment across programs. MAP may conditionally support a measure if the group thinks it's ready to, uh, for the rulemaking process uh, but needs to meet a condition such as uh, achieving NQF endorsement. Uh, the refine and resubmit category was something new for the 2016-2017 pre-rulemaking process. MAP implemented this category uh, to allow a way to express its support for the concept of a measure but to stipulate that it needs either modification or to finish development, uh, you know, such as completing testing before it could be implemented. And then finally, MAP may not support a measure uh, if it overlaps with existing measures in the program or if a different measure better addresses the needs of the program from MAP's perspective. Uh, next slide. So to facilitate MAP's consent calendar uh, voting process, NQF staff conduct a preliminary analysis of each measure under consideration. Uh, the preliminary analysis is an algorithm that asks a series of questions about each measure. Uh, this algorithm was designed from the measure selection criteria and is approved by the MAP coordinating committee uh, to evaluate each measure. And it's intended to help MAP members in their deliberations by providing a succinct snapshot of each measure and to serve as a starting point for MAPS deliberations. Uh, next slide. 
So on this slide, uh, you can see the series of assessments uh, that make up MAPS preliminary analysis algorithm. Uh, NQF staff uh, attempt to go through each of these uh, questions and provide MAP members with an overview of, of the measure to answer these assessments. Next slide. Uh, so I apologize that uh, this is a bit hard to read. Uh, there's a lot on this slide. Uh, but I did want to walk through uh, MAP's high-level timeline with you. So in September of each year, uh, the coordinating committee meets to discuss strategic guidance to the work group uh, to use during the pre-rulemaking process. In October and November, we convene the setting-specific work groups to review the measures that are currently in the program measure sets. As Michelle noted, on or before December 1st, uh, the list of measures under consideration is released by HHS. And that kicks off uh, the first public commenting period. Uh, we have a, um, as long as we can before the work groups um, for a week or two, uh, open a public commenting period where uh, members of the public and other interested stakeholders can submit information on the measures under consideration for the MAP work groups to consider in their deliberations. In December, we convened the three uh, setting-specific work groups in person to make initial recommendations on the measures under consideration. Uh, after the work groups meet, uh, we have our second public commenting period where we ask members of the public to weigh in on uh, the work group's deliberations and initial recommendations. In late January, uh, we convened the MAP Coordinating Committee to finalize MAP's input. And then uh, from February 1st through March 15th, uh, we release a series of pre-rulemaking deliverables. On February 1st, uh, we release MAPS recommendations on all individual measures under consideration. Uh, before February 15th, uh, we release MAPS guidance for hospital and post-acute care long-term care programs. And then before March 15th, uh, we release MAPS guidance for clinician as well as MAPS cross-cutting guidance from the pre-rulemaking process. Next slide. So on this slide, uh, you can see my, my sales pitch if anyone is interested in getting involved in MAPS work. I do want to highlight uh, one-third of the seats on MAP are eligible for reappointment each year. Uh, the formal call for nominations occurs in the early spring, uh, but NQF does accept nominations year-round. Uh, for this year, it is actually closing on April 6th, so if you are interested, uh, you can uh, go to our website for more information and to apply. Uh, you can see the, the address on the slide, and we uh, do seek nominations from both organizations as well as individual subject matter experts. Uh, so with that, I can move on to the next slide and turn it over to Vince. Hello, thank you, Erin. This is Vince Brown from Battelle. Um, just a reminder, we are accepting questions in the Q&A block, as Martin said at the top, and uh, there will be a time for questions after this demonstration of JIRA. Um, again, my name is Vince Brown. I appreciate everyone taking the time to be on the webinar today. Um, the purpose of my portion is to walk through some of the changes that were made to the JIRA interface this year. They were really very few. And then to orient um, any new users of JIRA for the measures under consideration and pre-rulemaking process to how it works and some of the um, features that people have found helpful to know from questions and feedback that we have received during prior cycles. Um, let's see. Martin, if you would, I want to switch to a uh, live screen uh, demo here real quick. And uh, so Martin, I think, is going to give me the ability to do that. And it should be changing over on your visual side. Um, now, I hope everyone can see a screen that says at the red at the top, you are not currently logged in. Please log in. I wanted to remind everyone that JIRA is a, a, per, a restricted access system. So you need to first sign up for a JIRA account and then uh, once you're in JIRA, and some of you have used JIRA for other projects related to uh, DHHS, uh, once your JIRA account is set up, then you also need to apply for access to the particular measures under consideration project for the current year. Uh, you do that using a user guide. Uh, their steps are outlined in a user guide that is posted on the CMS pre-rulemaking website. 
Michelle Jeppe had a link to that in a previous slide, and the user guide is linked there. I'll, I'll show that here in just a moment um, when we get to that part. So um, after you log in, after you're, you're granted your credentials and log in, Because I've used um, JIRA 2017 Measures Under Consideration Project before, it takes me there by default. If this is your first time visiting, you'll probably want to go up here where it says Projects and select uh, a list of all projects will show up. And then you uh, search for 2017 Measures Under Consideration. Uh, once you have visited that site, JIRA usually remembers where you were and takes you back there the next time you log in. It's very helpful that way. So um, here's the summary page, which describes the site. Um, and to uh, start a new uh, measure record, you would use this yellow Create button at the top. I'm not going to actually create a measure today, but I'll just walk you through what it looks like so that everyone can see it on the screen. Um, again, it identifies the project at the top. One of the new fields for users this year is um, JIRA always asks you for uh, the state of development of your measure. And so I'm going to scroll down now to where it asks that question. And right below that, you'll see a new field this year, State of Development Details. It is a free text box where you are asked to type in uh, details that describe the state of development. It seems to me that many of the measures that were rejected uh, in prior years, uh, some of the reasons had to do with uh, we couldn't tell where it was in its testing process, or we didn't have enough detail on the testing. So in consultation with stakeholders, we've added this new field for 2017 where you can describe uh, what testing has been completed or what is in process or planned as far as alpha and beta and in what kinds of populations or facilities. So that's one new feature that will help CMS determine whether or not to publish a measure on this year's MUC list. If you are submitting for the um, Merit-Based Incentive Payment System or MIPS program, uh, you are required as last year to complete a template that relates to a peer-reviewed journal article publication. And so I wanted to show you at the bottom of this create form is a place for you to attach that completed form. And then just as a reminder to yourself, here's a new field called MIPS journal article requirement, yes or no. You're asked to just click, click that as yes to signify that you, uh, you knew about the requirement and that you did attach that. Um, if you're new to MIPS, I want to show uh, what the template looks like. It is a, a one-page Word file that you can download, and uh, it has certain questions in it. I'll scroll through it. hope you can see it on the computer. Um, it, show, it just walks you through some questions that the MIPS program needs uh, to uh, evaluate the MIPS candidate measures. It has to do with gap analysis, uh, has it been tested for reliability, validity? What is its endorsement status? And then uh, these bottom summary questions have to do with what is its important to MIPS and so on and so forth. So this is what the, the blank form looks like. You're asked to open this, open one of these for each of your measures and fill it out and then attach it right in JIRA to your measure record. I'll jump back to JIRA. I will mention too on the pre-rulemaking website, there's also a sample completed form for MIPS. If you want to see what one sample looks like, just the kinds of information people are putting in there and attaching to their JIRA record. I um, wanted to mention, too, uh, if you have already submitted a measure for 2017 and you want to work on it some more, uh, you are welcome until May 1st to use the Edit button to edit that measure. I'm just going to pick one here and open that record. And you'll see in the upper left corner this button called Edit. When you click that button, a new screen pops up that says Edit. And this lets you go through and change any values that you need to. And so then when you get done, um, here's a button called Finished Editing, yes or no. 
if you click yes on that finished editing, as this uh, user has done, that's a signal to us and to the CMS that that measure, that you are finished changing it, and that measure should move ahead in the review workflow. And so then when you're done changing your measure, click update. I'm going to cancel just so we don't uh, make any mistake on this existing record, but you would click update when you're done editing. Um, one other uh, point I will mention this year, some of our fields have drop-down choices. Uh, for example, what NQS priority applies to this measure? Um, you are allowed to select any and all that apply. Some of our drop-downs are select one. This one happens to be a select all that apply. And our screen guidance uh, tells you hold down the control button when you click. That way you can select non-consecutive -sele non items out of that list as you go. Um, so that was one piece of user feedback that we incorporated in the JIRA interface this year. Um, we did add to the screen guidance for performance gap question. If I can find it here. The evidence of performance gap, and again, below each field is a, is a screen guidance description of what goes in that field. Um, and new to the guidance this year is they want CMS is asking for current rate of performance and standard deviation from that rate to demonstrate variability. And then please provide information on the testing data set. So any backup information you can provide in there, again, will help the CMS and the MAP groups and others evaluate your measure. As in past years, everyone is encouraged to collect all the measure information beforehand. Uh, one of the constraints of using JIRA is, and we get this question all the time, uh, users are not able to save and come back uh, like you can on your tax preparation software that, that I'm working on anyway. Uh, you're, you cannot save and go back in JIRA. It's meant for you to put all of your information in at one sitting. So uh, with this in mind, we've created a blank template in Word that, again, is an editable file that you can download. It's on the pre-rulemaking website. And this lets you put all your information into one handy file. When you do go into JIRA, then you can copy-paste from the template into JIRA. Let me cancel out of this, and I will show you what that template looks like. This has a, a basically a table that represents everything in JIRA. It has the field label, whether it's required. It, it copies what the screen guidance or instructions say. It tells you the data form. For example, if it's multi-select, select one, free text. And then if it's drop-down, it tells you what are the possible values you can choose in JIRA. The important column is over here at the right where it says add your content here. So if you save one of these templates for each of your measures, that way all of your uh, information is in one place. And it, it may help you when you get into JIRA so you don't, uh, you don't have to interrupt your, or repeat any data, field, data entry processes. So we encourage everyone to use that template. Um, switching back to JIRA real quickly, uh, besides creating or submitting a new measure, you can also use JIRA to ask a question of CMS related to the JIRA or the measures under consideration in pre-rulemaking process. You can also use uh, JIRA to provide feedback or improvements that you would suggest to the interface or any of the procedures. And then um, after the self-editing function ends, you can use JIRA or you can use this feature anytime, but especially after the self-editing feature ends, um, you can use this modified candidate measure issue type to uh, suggest a change to a measure that you've already submitted or to suggest that that measure be deleted. And then these measure, uh, modify candidate measure requests are routed through CMS to make sure that everyone is coordinated uh, who has an interest in that measure from the program and management side. Um, one other, uh, my last point is if you or someone you know uh, wants web access to the JIRA Measures Under Consideration Project, uh, I would direct you to the CMS pre-rulemaking website. Again, that link was shown. Uh, before, and I'll just jump to that on the screen. Here's where it looks. It's a public website uh, uh, run by CMS. And 
if you scroll down on here to where it says Jira, the JIRA system, you'll see here's a link to the 2017 user guide. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, pages 12 and 13 and Appendix A of that user guide describe how to go about getting access to JIRA itself if you've never used JIRA before. And then once you have your JIRA account set up, how to apply uh, to CMS because we want uh, the CMS programs to be aware of who is, who is getting access to JIRA. So um, that user guide describes um, how you go about getting access. I'll also mention that this pre-rulemaking down at the bottom, um, it has guidelines for proposing measures and it also has additional resources. For example, here's your template blank that I showed you a moment ago. Um, here's the uh, frequently asked questions that Martin referred to. And then these are the various priorities and needs reports. So as new uh, resources become available for 2017, they will be posted here as well as the recordings that Martin alluded to at the top of this webinar. Uh, once those recordings are available, you'll be able to link uh, for any of your colleagues who are not able to attend today's webinar, uh, you'll be able to link to that uh, using this pre-rulemaking website. Uh, this concludes the JIRA portion of the webinar. Now I understand that Nicole Brennan and others uh, will moderate the question and answer segment. Thank you. Thanks, Vince. And just as a reminder for everyone, you can submit your questions on uh, WebEx using the Q&A. And we will go ahead and jump right into the questions. We've had some that were submitted already. So the first question that we have today are, do you generally provide more feedback for refine and resubmit? I can imagine it would be difficult to guess how to interpret that from a development perspective. Michelle? I think that's for Aaron. Sure, I was going to say, I can take a, a first shot at that. Michelle, if you have anything to add. Um, so we do provide more guidance on the refine and resubmit. Uh, we'll provide a, a statement of rationale explaining what refinements map would suggest or uh, what they'd like to see completed in measure development before the measure could be fully supported by MAP. I'd say generally this year, uh, refine and resubmit, uh, the main uh, refinement MAP suggested was the completion of measure testing. Okay, thank you. Our second question, can you explain what each of the stage of development options means? I think that might go to Michelle. It has to do with early development, field testing, or fully developed. Those are the three choices in JIRA. Yeah, and this is Maria. I'll, you know, I'll take a stab at this and please others weigh in. You know, um, over the last few years, you know, we have a fair amount of experience in knowing, you know, what measures are most uh, appealing to the map and, and most ready for inclusion in our programs. So, you know, although we definitely have situations where we need to, to have the public eye on measures, you know, ahead of being absolutely fully tested and specified and ready, you know, what has fared best in the map are, are measures that are, that are truly specified and, and tested and ready. So, you know, we try very hard to kind of gauge, you know, where a measure is um, in terms of development because, of course, we want it to be successful when it gets in front of the map. And we want to get the full complement of, of comments. And, you know, if it's, if it's not tested and it's not ready, you know, the, the conversation ends up being a little bit more about the science versus, you know, the utility of the measure in the program. And that's definitely the focus is we want these measures to be useful and successful in our programs. Thank you, Maria. Our third question is, what is the appropriate state of development to select for a measure that is undergoing testing at the time of submission? Yeah, I, I think I just answered that as well. Yeah, thanks. Uh, email if you feel I didn't. Um, yeah. All right, next question. Section 5 summary of the peer review template includes a question on alignment with QMS quality strategy, where there's a list of priorities to select from. There's another question on importance to MIPS. Is there a similar list to select from for that? 
Uh, this is Vince Brown. Uh, Michelle, I don't know if uh, Jennifer Harris might be available. She may not be on the uh, presenter list today. Um, I'm not aware of a list of importance to MIPS options. I think that's intended to be a free text field. Okay. Agree with Thank you, Vince. Vince. Thank you, Vince. And I think that was Maria. This is Michelle. Yes. If, if um, the, the person that submitted that question, if they want to just go ahead and email me, I can get it over to the program lead, which is Jennifer Harris, to respond to that question. Thank you. Okay, just a reminder, if you have any questions, please feel free to submit them in the Q&A box. This time we don't have any additional questions. We can just wait here a couple of minutes for any others to come in before we wrap up today's presentation. Uh, Nicole, I see one. This is Vince. I just saw it just came in. Does the MAP or CMS or NQF have any plans to create a resource for organizations to register measure topics so organizations can ensure they are not duplicating efforts? Um, this might uh, bear with the uh, relation to the measure inventory that CMS publishes, um, but others may be better able to answer that. Yeah, and this is Maria, and I'll, I'll take a step from a CMS perspective, and Aaron, feel free to weigh in. I mean, for sure, um, in the measures inventory, um, one of the improvements that we've made over time is to include a list of measures under development um, so that folks can have a sense of, of what is in progress. I know that, you know, that's something that NQF also, I believe, solicits um, information on as well um, through their processes. Sure, and this is Erin. To weigh in from the NQF perspective, uh, we do uh, try to get that information as well. Uh, it's generally not through the MAP process, uh, rather through our uh, measure pipeline and some other uh, other feedback mechanisms that we're working on implementing. Uh, so I think I don't want to misspeak. Uh, so let me uh, look into that with some of my colleagues here and see uh, if I can connect you better with what resources NQF does have in place. And this is Vince Brown again, I'm, 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 if I might add. Uh, one of the, I sometimes get the question, have you ever seen a measure about this topic? And you know, it's our job to go find it. And so I've, I've looked on the NQF website and uh, looked in past year's MAP recommendations reports or passed on the CMS website on past measures under consideration lists. And you, you can search um, any of those that are available and look for a given title. That will at least tell you if it was considered or went to MAP in a prior year. So that's been a useful resource. As Maria Durham noted, uh, that is uh, being added to the CMS measure inventory. So hopefully uh, you can go to one place and find uh, find information about any particular topic. Thank you, Vince. A quick question on accessing the measures inventory. Uh, where can the measures inventory be found? Uh, it's, it's on our website. Uh, we can definitely uh, provide uh, the link. Give me about two seconds and we can put it in the comment section. Great, thank you. Next question, if a measure completes testing between June 30th JIRA submission and the December MAP meeting, is there any way to update the testing status or provide the MAP committee with findings from additional testing? Michelle, this is Maria. You know, I'm going to assume it's going to depend how close <laughs> the time frame is to the point that the measure is going to the map and whether it's already gone out to the map members or not. But it's definitely something that if it weren't updated could be stated verbally at the meeting and 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 and, and described in the minutes. And That's in fact, this is correct. correct. If I could, um, in, in 2016, CMS sent out a, an email message to all measure owners uh, who had a measure under consideration to encourage them to attend the MAP. Maybe maybe most of them do already, but I remember uh, this was one of the, in, the motives in sending that message was so that any questions or new developments could be brought forward at the MAP process that didn't make press time for the December MUC list. And this is Erin. I did just want to weigh in uh, from the NQF perspective. Uh, we do uh, reach out to measure developers 
to try to get this information, but as Maria was saying, it does uh, come down to when the update would be ready vis-a-vis uh, -vis our in-person meetings and when we start, need to start getting materials out to, um, to the committees. Uh, we ask that all this information um, about updated status of the measure is submitted ahead of time. It gets a little confusing for the MAP members when uh, people are public commenting with real-time updates. So uh, we do attempt to reach out to developers ahead of time, uh, but again, it's, it's a timing issue, as Maria was noting. All right, our next question is, is the timeline to submit updates for measures that receives a revise and re resubmit classification during the 2016 MAP the same timeline as for new measures? Example, submit by June 30th. So this is Michelle, if I may just, um, I think what the person is asking is if a measure received a refine and submit, they want to know if that measure should be resubmitted to the measures under consideration list. And that's a great question. So thank you for submitting it. And the answer is um, no, we would not need those measures back on the measures under consideration list for this uh, season. Um, and Maria or Aaron, if you guys would want to weigh in on that. Sure. Uh, as Michelle was saying, uh, the, ex the expectation is not that uh, measures that receive refine and resubmit would be uh, resubmitted through the formal measures under consideration list. As Michelle noted, uh, a measure only needs to go on the, the list once uh, from the CMS perspective. Uh, I think we are working on building out additional ways uh, that developers could bring the measures that receive that uh, categorization back to MAP and provide them an update on development and uh, receive additional feedback. Um, it's, again, the, the category was new for this year, so we're still working out the, the process flow from it, but I think we're, we're hoping to uh, refine the pre-rulemaking process to allow a mechanism for people to come back, uh, perhaps through the, the fall web meetings for a, a more informal touch base with MAP. Uh, Michelle, Maria, anything you wanted to, to add to, from the CMS perspective? No, I think you covered it. Thanks, Erin, for adding that in. And just to, um, I don't know how closely people follow the process this year, uh, but we piloted a similar uh, process with the post-acute care or long-term care work group um, to implement a, a feedback loop between CMS developers and the MAP, and that was very well received. So we're looking to see what we can do to uh, implement that more broadly. So there was just another follow-up question regarding the MAP process and formal ways to update the MAP on uh, testing status. And uh, Would you like us just to add that to our Q&A list we can follow up with in QF? Yeah, I think, that's, I think that's a great idea. I mean, if it's still undergoing testing, you know, when you're submitting it for the MAP, you know, it's, it's not fully developed and tested at the same time, you know, that status changes over time and, and we definitely, you know, can work out a way to, to update those materials to the extent that we can. Yes, and just to add as well, the question that was submitted regarding the CMS inventory and where to find the link. Um, unfortunately, we're not able to put that link into the WebEx application, so that will uh, be included in the frequently asked questions uh, document that's going to be on the CMS website. So look for it there, please. Do we have any, any additional questions, Nicole? Or? It looks like that is it for right now. Thanks, Michelle. Sure. Well, thanks, everyone, for submitting your questions. Great questions. Good discussion. And I'd like to just take this opportunity to thank Vince, Aaron, and Dr. Long for your time today and sharing information about pre-rulemaking. Uh, with that, we're going to go ahead and close today's session and um, look for the, the link. Um, to pass along to your colleagues that may have missed this session today. Like we had said earlier, the, the session is being recorded and the link will be 
sent out along with the updated uh, questions and answers. So thanks everyone for your time. We appreciate it and uh, have a good spring.